Centennial United Methodist Church at the St. Anthony Park campus. Let's uh, let's stand and worship together. Ready for an old one? Here we go.
same God. You are a healer. You are a healer. You are the same God. You are the same God. You are a Savior. You are a Savior. You are the same. Thank you for the opportunity to come to this place, sing praises to your name. Together as a, a messy family, family who's got its stuff, but God, together through the gifts of everyone here, through your grace, through your healing, things are being made new every single day. It's in your son's name we pray, amen. Would you please be seated. church. Good morning. Welcome to Centennial United Methodist Church, especially if you're new. Uh, my name is Pastor Whitney Sheridan. I'm the lead pastor here. And no, before you walked in the door, we have been praying for you and we are glad you are here. And if you are new and looking for a faith family, we would love to be your faith family. Amen. Amen. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Our mission here at Centennial is to be authentic, thinking, and active disciples of Jesus, and we are glad you are here. Take a moment, if you're new or if you're looking for any more information or have a prayer request, fill out our Connect card, which is our, um, our way of just uh, you letting us know what information you need and kind of a connection point. So you can get to a virtual one through the QR code up there, um, or you can find paper versions in your seat backs. You can throw those into the offering plate when those come around. A reminder that if you um, volunteer in any capacity, and hear me when I say in any capacity, you volunteer here at church, um, we have uh, a training for you, a volunteer training this coming Wednesday. If you weren't able to make last week's, we'd really encourage you to try to uh, make this week's Wednesday over at our Roseville campus, August 7th, from eight or 6 to 8, and we will have dinner for you and child care if you need it. Um, it is how we can bring you up to speed on kind of all things church and all things that have changed so we're talking church structure, church culture, core values, and also helping you um, help others get connected in the church and all the ways that you can let folks know about. Um, so again, that's August 7th. And then next Sunday, August 11th, after worship, um, we're going to have some leadership board folks here um, giving a financial update for our church. All of the nitty-gritty details, the questions that you might have. If you have questions about our finances here at church, um, show up, hang out after worship, um, and we will be here to share all that we know with you so that we can move together and be transparent together. 
All right, I think that is all I have. Would you stand and let us pass the peace of Christ to one another? And kiddos, you can head down to Faith Walk, which is our version of Sunday school. Head on down. Um, and if you're new and you've got kiddos here and it's best for your family, for your kids to stay right here with you, know that's, that is A-OK -okay by us. And we are glad they are here. All right. Oh, well, family of faith, would you just take a great big deep breath and let us pray. Holy and loving and gracious God, we thank you for this day. And we thank you for this moment to pause and to breathe. To breathe in your spirit. To remember that we sit here in this worship space, not alone, but together. And we ask, oh God, that what needs to be said, may it be said this day. And what needs to be heard, may it truly be heard. We ask all of this in the name of Jesus and all God's people said, amen. All right, folks, it is week four of this five-week sermon series. We've got one more to go after this, um, of a sermon series that we are calling Bless This Mess, all about acknowledging that we are messy folks, that we live in a messy world, that we're trying to navigate messy systems. And yet this messiness can lead us to be really distracted and really distorted even, kind of pulled in a million different directions. And so how in the world do we navigate the mess that we're in in order to receive and to reach and to be transformed and restored in the grace of Jesus Christ? And I will say, since we started this sermon series, it seems like every single day, I don't know, Pastor Jen, if this is the same for you, but it feels like every person we Every time I am um, interacting with someone from church throughout the week, someone references like, hey, it's because it's a mess, right? Ah, ah, ah. And it's like, I think something is hitting, right? Something is hitting home in this message, yes? Because we are all, maybe it's kind of a nice little change of pace to acknowledge that we are not perfect, that things don't always go great all of the time, and that we are messy. Our minds are messy. Our families are messy. Our, our homes and our workplaces our lives, our world, are messy. And so we have been taking this time to acknowledge that. We've kind of taken every week to just talk about kind of a step in the direction of restoration. So we started with week one, and that is just face the mess, y'all. Acknowledge and say it out loud. It's a mess in here. We are messy. I remember when I was making um, worship slides or like uh, coming up with the pictures that are going to be behind us. Um, and my husband was looking over my shoulder, looking at my laptop, and I was like Googling pictures of a messy living room. And he would say, Whitney, just take a picture of the thing in front of us. And I went, I know, I know, I know, but that's a little vulnerable. That's <laughs> <laughs> so we are mess. So what can we do? Fate one is just say it out loud, right? Hello, I'm Whitney Sheridan, and I am a mess. Yes, that is step one. Week two, we talked about um, noticing, just noticing with grace alongside you. Notice the ways that perhaps we have been really good at justifying the mess, right? Hey, it's a messy system, and I'm just, trying to, I'm just trying to feed my family. I'm just trying to make it from one day to the next. Yes, it's a mess now, but just when I finally get to the end of this week, or I finish this to-do list, or I get to, I get to whatever, like, whatever uh, roadblock or whatever, whatever marker far off in the future, then it'll be totally fine. So I'm just going to be a mess for now. We are really good at justifying the mess, yes? And last week we talked about how if God is here to restore us, if Jesus came truly into our mess, into our world to bring us restoration, are there ways that we have maybe even sat back and said, look, it's just going to be a mess and there's no change to it. There's no change in it. And how do we need to acknowledge those little circles of thought in our heads? 
and remind us that restoration is indeed possible. There is a reason that Christ came to walk alongside us. There is a reason that we are offered and given grace upon grace, and there's a difference that it can make in our lives. So how to simply acknowledge and say out loud and maybe say again aspirationally, I believe that transformation and restoration in Christ is possible. And then once we do that, like how do we actually do that restorative work, right? I promise we weren't stringing you along just to like leave you hanging and say, we'll figure it out at the end. Um, so we're going to be jumping back into the Gospel of Luke, um, where Lu uh, Jesus is wandering around. He is teaching, and he comes to a city um, and walks into a house of two sisters. So let us read together um, from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 10, verses 38 to 42. Now, as they went on their way, he entered a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him. She had a sister named Mary who sat at Jesus' feet and listened to what he was saying. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks. So she came to him and asked, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things, but few things are needed, indeed only one. Mary has chosen the better part, which will not be taken away from her. All right, raise your hand if you've heard this story before. Yes, many of us. Keep your hand in the air if you would even say this is one of your favorite stories in scripture. I know it is for some folks, yeah? Yeah. Um, a lot of us talk about, like, are you Mary or Martha people? Are you going through a Martha season or a Mary season, right? We can go, these are kind of this um, dualism here represented in these two sisters. So Jesus is teaching. He's being welcomed into homes. Last week we um, read about, Zacch two weeks ago, it was Zacchaeus, um, who Jesus said, hey, I'm coming over to your house for dinner. He's wandered into, this week he's wandered into this home of Mary and Martha, these two sisters, to eat and be welcomed, and hospitality was a really, really big deal. There were expectations and ways to show respect and reverence when someone comes into your home. And you can tell here, Martha is feeling that responsibility, amen? She is running around, Jesus is here, not just like neighbor Larry, but like Jesus is coming over, yes? Jesus is actually in her living room, sitting there, Holy cow. All right, so, and Mary starts to buzz. She is buzzing around doing all of the tasks. She wants to fix a meal. We want to make some bread. Okay, I've got to go take a grain. I've got to grind it down into flour. We've got to put it in. We've got to mix it. We've got to let it prove. We've got to get all this stuff going. She has got a list, and she's going, ticka, 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 ticka. You can almost hear the motor running, amen, in this story. And you can feel the weight that she has, right? She wants to show Jesus this much respect and reverence that she can't bear to sit down because she wants to make sure everything is perfect. And frankly, this is what would have been expected of her and of women who were acting as hosts to really anyone kind of above their stature. I would even bear to say that this is maybe the expectation of women still, um, and a lot of us, yes, when people come over to your home, we have a, every culture seems to have like a ritual, right, of welcoming someone into your home and what are ways and what are tasks we go through in order to make sure that person knows that they are special, that they are welcome, and that we are glad they are here. So what Martha do, is doing, right, we can relate to it. Raise your hand if you can relate to Martha. Like Martha is the one you would be, yes? Someone walks in and you like... I have an Aunt Sharon uh, who, when we have family meals, she sits at the end when we're at her house. She sits at the end, and we call it her hot seat because she, like, barely ever sits down before she's like, oh, you need one more thing. Oh, I'm going to run to the kitchen. Like, won't sit down, right? This would have been expected of her, and she is going, and she is buzzing, and she is so anxious and distracted by all of the things that need to get done. I bet she is zeroing in on like the dust bunnies that have needed cleaning, but like she's definitely noticing them when Jesus is in the living room, yeah? So she is buzzing and buzzing and buzzing, and you can tell that the anxiety is rising in her. Because as she is going and running around the house trying to make sure everything is perfect, she sees her sister Mary sitting on the floor, taking it easy, on her knees before Jesus to listen to him. 
which frankly is something we wouldn't really see very often. Rabbis did not often take or welcome female students. So the fact that this was a rabbi and this was a respected rabbi and, and he was welcoming women into discipleship, like she wasn't going to miss it. So she sat down. Jesus is here and I don't want to miss it. So I'm going to sit down and soak up every moment and every word and every breath. Boy, do I aspire to be like Mary sometimes. But Martha sees this, and she can't see kind of this. She can't see the pause in Mary. She only sees Mary not moving as quickly as she is and not jumping to the task. And so Martha turns to Jesus. Can we actually go back? Let's go one more. The gall, I just want to like, let's read this one more time because what Martha has to say is actually like, oh, girl, all right. Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her then to help me. Fascinating that in her efforts to like show all this reverence for Jesus, this is what she says to him, right? Right? It has built up in her so much, this anxiety and this worry and this being pulled in a million directions that Martha turns to Jesus and blames Mary for her anxiety. I wouldn't feel this way if Mary was helping, right? And then tries to guilt Jesus. Why don't you tell her to get up and help me? Aren't you distracted and kind of put like put off by how she's not doing what she's supposed to be doing? That is a very human response, amen? Boy, oh boy, can I feel this Mary thing. Or when I am so distracted and running from one task to the next, my poor husband, right, who like immediately gets blamed for the state of the house when I'm having a bad day at work. Like, why aren't you helping? Don't you see how stressed I am, right? Anyone else? Not just me. Anyone else? Yep. How married are you? Like, that's the good question. Yep. She then suddenly starts to blame other people for kind of the state she's in, for her anxiety, for her worry, for her distractedness. And God bless Jesus, who says, Martha, Martha, Mary has chosen, thank you, let's go. Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things, but few things, few things are needed. Indeed, only one. Mary has chosen the better part, which will not be taken away from her. This word that Jesus used for distracted um, is perispao. Everyone say perispao. It's a Greek word for distracted, but it also means being pulled in many directions. Y'all felt like that, right? Y'all felt like you have been running out of limbs in the, a number of directions and places that you were being pulled? Yeah. That one hits home. That one comes home. She is being pulled in so many directions that she is being distracted by the one thing that she actually needs, and she knows she needs, right? She knows that Jesus is a big deal. She knows that she is glad that Jesus has chosen her home to come to. She knows that she desires a relationship with Jesus, and yet she is so distracted by all of the things, all the ways that she wants to make it perfect, and all the ways that things aren't perfect, and all the things that are expected of her, that she can't pause to relish in what is right in front of her. And boy, oh boy, does that hit home for me, and I'm guessing for a lot of us. And so when we are so distracted and so busy, and I'm guessing that when we start to look, and I've asked you, like, turn and face the mess and try to, like, try to even pinpoint and see the mess and the distractions and the busyness around you, like, this is a lot of what comes up, right? We have a to-do list that is miles long. There are a million places and a million things that all of us expect ourselves to be a part of and do and take care of, yes? How many times have you had to tell yourself, hey, there's just not, there aren't enough hours in the day 
to get all that needs to be done, done, right? So when we are this distracted, when the mess is caused by all the things that we've piled up around ourselves that we've decided we are the ones that need to take care of before we can dismiss them, what in the world do we do? And I feel like this scripture is trying to tell us. Trying to say, we are distracted, you are distracted, we are distracted by many things, few of which are actually needed. And he said, actually, just one thing. That peace that we are perpetually chasing, that being able to feel valued and like we've done a good job, that way of being, that self-esteem that we are perpetually running after, and instead piling up all of these, well, we can't feel that way until we do X, Y, and Z. All of this, these feelings that we are chasing of being at peace and being good and doing a good job, right? We are being distracted by a bunch of things and truly the only thing we need, the only thing that will actually make a difference and set us free is a relationship with Jesus and time with Christ. And so today we're going to be talking about spiritual practices and the need of them. Raise your hand if you, when I say a spiritual practice, you have any idea what I'm talking about, right? So some of us, yes, like a routine, a ritual, some time set apart for you to spend with God. It can be I'm going to go take a walk. It can be I'm getting up when the house is still quiet to have coffee and just listen to the silence. It can be when you're in your car and you actually turn the radio and the audiobook or anything off, just to be just to consider. And there are a lot of spiritual practices, y'all. And um, I even read, uh, read something today that spiritual practices are kind of like an inhale and an exhale. Spiritual practices can be exhaling. It can be getting rid of stuff. It could be abstaining from certain practices or saying, I'm just not going to do that. I need less so that I can focus on what really needs to be focused on. Or can, it can be an inhale. It can be something that I'm taking on, something that I'm deciding to do. I'm reading scripture. I'm praying. I'm serving in a certain way. So these spiritual practices, time set apart to actually bear before God what you need worked on, what you need help with. And I will tell you, full disclosure, and this is a safe place, yes? I'm even going to say for a pastor, but I think for anyone, I'm terrible at spiritual practices, or at least like maintaining them. I get bored really easily, so like, like, six-week seasons like Lent are perfect for me. I can usually do something and maintain something for about six weeks, but I find my spiritual practice is changing all of the time. Have you, do, does anyone here have a spiritual practice that you've had for, like, years? Like, five or ten years? You've gotten up at the same time? God bless you, Catherine. God bless any of y'all. Somehow you will teach me your ways someday. But I will say there is a reason, there are lots of reasons, but there is a re one of the reasons I love being a pastor is because I get bored so easily and there are a million things to do when you're a pastor. You can f you're off to care for something, you're off to organize something, you're off to print something and a million things and we're color coding and we're scheduling and we're calendaring, we're meeting with people, we are dealing with hard stuff, we're dealing with easy stuff and you can kind of pick and choose depending on your energy for the day. But boy, oh boy, does that, you can hear my, Y'all hear how I'm preaching to myself too? The ticka 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 ticka. Yeah. Uh huh. Uh huh. Uh huh. I said since I have become the lead pastor, I've found my need for spiritual practices to change and to find a new one, and working on them because the hamster wheel is real. There is a lot to do. There is a lot that we are responsible for from day to day. And so as I'm talking about spiritual practices, please know that if you have had to change them, if you've gone up and down, if you tried one thing and then tried another, that's okay. But it's worth taking time to consider how intentional we are being with our spiritual practices. If we have taken the time to assess the mess, to talk about how we've justified the mess, to believe in that transformation and restoration, but then how do we go about and do it? How do we ask God and when do we ask God to change my relationship with someone else or to be, to transform my relationship with someone that might be in conflict or tense, right? 
if you have a decision to make, if you have a vice you're trying to give up, all of these things and all of these like things that have piled up around us, but like how are we actually letting God cook? How are we giving time for God to make those changes to help us discern? It's kind of like folks who have ever gone um, to the doctor and been hand saying, oh, you need physical therapy in order to feel better. So you go to the physical therapist and they ask you what's wrong and you're like, here's my laundry list of stuff and then they hand you a bunch of exercises and they say, great, I need you to do these three times a week. There is a difference between getting that piece of paper and reading it and then going to do it. Yes, yes. I know this is bad news for a lot of us. <laughs> we need time. And God needs that time with you to talk and to walk alongside you, to hear from you, and for us to hear from God. And if you are hearing this and saying, yes, Pastor Whitney, but all I'm hearing is there's one more thing to do in my laundry list of things, because I bet that's some of us. It was certainly me too. Here's something I've started telling myself, and this might be just for me, but I'm going to share it just in case it's for at least one more of you. I have perpetually been telling myself, hey, there, is not, there aren't enough hours in the day to get all the things on your list done. And so you just have to be okay with it not all getting done. If you are at that point where you are saying you just have to be okay with it not all getting done, then what do you have to lose by taking time away each day to be with God and to let more stuff not get done? in the meantime. What do you have to lose? And then think about what you have to gain. If we are able to spend even the smallest bit of time, but intentional time, being quiet, communing and listening, thinking over all the people in your life that you love, that you are praying for, that are going through a hard thing and you are praying for them, all of the decisions you have to make that you are praying for God's discernment on, all of the stuff that you feel overwhelmed on that you are desperately trying to ask God to like see you through, we need that time to bear it before God, amen? We need that time to say, here's all the stuff. God, bring about restoration and help. And I wonder suddenly how much more smoothly our days might go when you have to make that decision and instead of continu continually waffling, did I or didn't I, did I put enough thought on it or not, maybe you might feel, maybe we might feel more peace in the decision made because we know that we spent time with God over it. So if we believe transformation is possible, how much time are you giving to the process of that transformation and that restoration? How much time are you giving to God? And how much hope are you putting in, truly putting in, to being restored, to finding that peace that we are desperate for? May God give us holy courage to make those moves, yeah, to try something new, to take on a spiritual practice that might actually and really make a difference in our lives. Amen? Let's pray. God of grace and God of love, your restoration is real and possible. And yet for so many of us, the noise and the distractions and the to-do lists are so loud. It's so commanding of our time and ourselves and our worthiness and our hopes. God, hear us and see us as we are. Remind us again and again that you desire for us restoration and peace and being made whole and being filled with grace, not just when we get it all done, but now. Give us that holy courage to set time aside to look for you, to listen for you, and to trust that that, that this relationship is what we actually need 
what we actually have been looking for that will actually make the change. We pray all of this out of our thanks and gratitude for you, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and all God's people said, Amen. we come to our time of offering, I'll invite our ushers to come forward to receive these gifts. We do believe that our giving of our gifts is a spiritual practice that draws us closer into community with God and one another. There's a QR code or text to give option as well as the offering plate. Friends, we live in a messy world, full of imperfect, messy, and distractible people. And most likely, we are all trying to do the best that we can. Know that whatever kind of mess or messes you have been dealing with, or cleaning up, or ignoring, or trying to get through, that you are welcome here here in this community, and especially here at this table. Your mistakes, my mistakes, they are not too big for God. God's love and God's grace are poured out for you again and again and again. Whenever we gather together for communion, we remember the night that Jesus gathered with his friends. We remember how one of those friends would betray Jesus. And still, Jesus gathered them all together. And he took bread and he gave thanks to you. He broke the bread and gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body, broken, given for you. As often as you eat this, remember me. When the supper was over, Jesus took the cup he gave thanks to you and he gave it to his disciples saying take and drink this is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you for many for the forgiveness of sins do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me would you pray with me God of grace fall afresh on us gathered here in person and online pour out your Holy Spirit on these simple gifts of bread and the vine. May they truly be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we might be for the world, the body of Christ, redeemed by your love. As we go out to serve in ministry to this big and beautiful and messy world, as we gather at this table once again to receive your life and your love, may we be so humble and so to stop the spinning and to come to meet you again and again. We pray all of this in the name of your Son who taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever Amen. Friends,
into the body of Christ. Broken for you. The blood of Christ for each of us. You come to the feast. Our ushers, our communion servers will come forward. As you come forward to receive piece of bread will be given to you that you can then dip into the cup to receive both elements together. We have gluten-free bread available as well as fully sealed elements. Please come to the feast. Brother, lay your head down. Sister, don't you know? Ain't no rest in worry. Troubles come and troubles go. I have seen the sparrow. I have watched her fly. No, she does not worry. Tell me why should I so hold on? The things are going to get better. It's gonna get better, I know it's hard. Hold on, the things are gonna get better. Things are gonna get better, I know they are. I have seen the in the wind, open to the sunshine, open to the rain, dressed in all her beauty, giving what she needs. If I listen closely, I can hear her sing to me. Hold on, the things are gonna get better. Things are gonna get better. I know. I was lost, I was asleep at the wheel, I was drifting off, my heart was failing, my heart was failing, in the dark, heard a song, it was the sweetest sound that I ever heard, and my soul went sailing, yeah, my soul Get up! 
restoration is possible and is here for you. So let us take the time to seek it and to know it. May you go from this place knowing the love of God and the grace of Jesus Christ and the peace of the Holy Spirit is with you with every breath and step and heartbeat. Go from this place to love and serve the Lord. And all God's people said, Amen.